Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you are listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. You'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. Hi everyone and welcome to part two of my recording with the awesome Joe Lang. If you haven't already listened to part one, I highly encourage you to do that first. You can find it as the previous episode to this one in your podcast app. And in part one, you can hear Joe's bio and more information about his five plus decades of experience in the experimental and applied analysis of behavior. We will waste no time today, though, and just dive straight in to where we left off last time. Enjoy. I, I really enjoyed some of your definitions there, and I wanted to ask for a definition on, on something else you've said today mm-hmm. um, to build on and say, sure, to repeat what you've already said, uh, and that is degrees of freedom. I was hoping you could sure. offer us a definition of that. Right. And uh, this is an important concept first introduced by Gold Diamond in 1976. Uh, he was looking at, uh, it was called the protection of research subjects and um, patients in hospitals for procedures. And the question was, what does it mean to be truly informed consent? And so he applied this analysis. He developed this analysis in response to that question. Um, and it's one of, a, it's a long article, but it's a, uh, I highly recommend reading it. It's in the journal, published in the journal Behaviorism. It was a report to the federal government on this topic, uh, but it was then published in the journal Behaviorism. I have that paper. I could send it to you and you could distribute it as you see fit. Um, But in short, uh, he talked about many, many things in that paper. But in short, degrees of freedom mean that if we have an occasion and behavior and a consequence, right, that that we cannot get the consequence unless both the occasion and behavior occur. So... If we have the behavior, but not the opportunity, right, to engage in that behavior, we're not going to be able to get the consequence. Uh, If the opportunity is there, but we don't have the behavior, you know, people say, oh, look at all the jobs in the newspaper. Well, I don't have the skills for any of those jobs. There might as well be no jobs in the newspaper, right? So if I don't have the behavior, but the opportunity is there, I'm still not going to get the consequence. And I could have the skills and the opportunity may be there. And I still may not be able to get the consequence. But the only way to get that consequence is if I engage in that behavior on that occasion. So that actually is what is meant by contingency. It means that the consequence will only occur if both the occasion and behavior occur. But even if the occasion and behavior occur, the consequence may not occur. That's what gives us our schedules of reinforcement. So every time I peck the lighted key doesn't mean I get food, right? So this is what's meant by contingency. Now, if every time it occurs, so that every time I see a consequence, I know the occasion of behavior occurred, and every time I see the occasion of behavior occur, I know the consequence occurred, that defines what we call a dependency. So that's the difference between a dependency and a contingency. Contingency has a uh, hint of chanciness. It's a, of a probability relation, probability of reinforcement. But the only way to get it is still to engage in those behaviors. So... If the only way that consequence can be obtained is to behave under a particular occasion, and there is no other way, there is no other alternative contingency available to produce that same consequence, I basically have zero degrees of freedom. I'm coerced into doing it. If I'm hungry and I can only do one thing to get the food, I'm coerced into doing that one thing. So most of the pigeons in our laboratories 
who were food deprived and then placed in experiments, of course, are coerced into the experiment, even though they're experiments on positive reinforcement. So what we look at then is, okay, if I have another occasion and another behavior, which can produce the same consequence or similar consequence, close enough, right? That it's substitutable. Well, then I could do one or the other. I have then one degree of freedom. Now, you can look at this in a larger societal sense and say, okay, so let's say I, there's a field and I have agriculture skills and someone will pay me for them. All right, that's good. Now, if there's a mill and I have milling skills, whatever those are, I have no idea, milling skills and someone will pay me similar, I can choose to work in the fields or the mill, right? Now, let's say there's a mine up in the hills and I have mining skills and someone will pay me. So now I can work in the mills, I can work in the mine, I can work in the fields. I have two degrees of freedom. And what does that mean for me personally is that then the other consequences that are not critical, and that is getting paid is what's really important in these kids. Right? But now I can say, well, do I want to get the blisters on my hands from working in the field? Do I want to uh, 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 breathe in the mill dust or the coal dust? Or is there one further away from my house than another? And these are what we call program-specific consequences. So the money benefit is the critical consequence. The other consequences that occur, but do not govern the consequence unless the critical consequences are equal, are what we call program-specific consequences. Sometimes the program-specific consequence and the critical consequence is the same. But typically in what we're, when things that we're dealing with in this regard, they're often not the same. So when we say we feel free, what we're really saying is the critical consequences among alternatives are basically the same. So the program specific uh, consequences can influence what I will do. That's how the basis of making my choice, right? So in a case of informed consent, I work, I'm in a prisoner in, a, in an institution and I'm give, I've said, okay, you engage in allowing us to do this experimental medical treatment on you, and we'll cut four years off your prison term. Ah, four years off. But here are the side effects. Oh, and if you listen to any of the TV ads now, you hear all the side effects of these drugs. <laughs> I don't know how anybody will take anything after listening to the side effects. You know, you're, you'll bleed out of your eyes potentially. You know, you'll have, could be death from this or that or whatever. Whatever the side effects are. And But if there's no other way to get four years off my sentence, the, those side effects basically will have very little to do with my decision. Unless maybe I have a 100-year sentence. <laughs> then maybe it will. But let's say I have a six-year sentence or a five-year sentence. Whoa. I could get out four years earlier. and by, So the informed consent really has no meaning. But if I say to the prisoner, listen, you can choose to work in the library for two years under these conditions every day, or you can engage in this medical experiment and each one gives you four years off your sentence. Oh, now I'm weighing the side effects from the medical treatment versus the drudgery of working in the library. I have one degree of freedom from the critical, con given the critical consequence of time off from my session, All right? And in an animal uh, a relations, Ken Ramirez uh, described a procedure they're doing, I believe, with their whales. May be wrong on that, but I believe it was the whales. Whereby they would give the animal the hand signal to do the routine, and the animal could go out and do its routine and come back and get a fish. And I guess a little scratch on the tongue. I guess they like that too. <laughs> but the, uh, Or the animal could swim over a few feet and there uh, tethered to the side of the pool was a big red ball. And all the animal had to do was whap the ball with its nose and it would get the fish. In essence, the animal had one degree of freedom to get its fish. So the question is, will the animal do the routine or will the animal just simply go over and do the fish? So if there are elements to the routine that are reinforcing for the, not fish, I'm sorry, it's a whale, for the, it gets its fish. I don't want to make... I'm going to make sure I'm making that. It's eating a fish. It is a whale. It's an animal. I know the difference. So the, the whale gets the signal, goes out and does a routine, doesn't go hit its nose. Well, there must be something reinforcing that's going on in the routine. And that tells me my routine is kind of fun, I guess you'd say, for the, for the animal. 
On the other hand, if I did it, and it goes over, look at it, it's onerous. And what they found was quite fascinating. It depended upon which trainer gave the signal. So it turns out that trainers that had really good relationships and really crisp and good procedures in terms of giving hand signals, the animal would go out and do the whole routine. But if it was a little bit sloppy trainer, or one new that didn't quite know what they were doing a little bit, the animal would go over and hit the red thing. Now, what's fascinating about this is that they do the routine for the sloppy trainer if there wasn't the alternative of hitting the ball. In other words, they could be coerced into doing it for the fish. They knew what to do. The difference is they just didn't like the way you know, it, was go- it was being handled, if you want to put it that way. So by having these degrees of freedom, you can ascertain things about the training and the procedures that would not otherwise be available to understand because the critical consequences then are made equal. You can find out those things. When they're not equal, the animal's coursed into doing it. I remember uh, watching a video by a very famous horse trainer, uh, uh, Alex Curlin, and she showed a video of a horse uh, being ridden around a circular corral, a large circular corral. And as the horse got to a certain point in the, in the corral, when it made a turn, it grimaced. Now, the rider actually couldn't see the grimace, <laughs> all right? Uh, but the video that was being taken, you could see it. And what she was pointing out was that there was a torque being put on the knee of the horse that was creating that aversive event that the horse probably, you know, that we'd probably call pain, all right? Now, from the point of view of the rider, well, so the horse is being reinforced, it's padded, and so on. So in essence, um, reinforcement can maintain behavior through activities that otherwise would be avoided, such as that pain. Well, she developed procedures which gave the horse different balance and so on, and demonstrated that she could basically teach new patterns, which replaced the old balance and patterns of walking that the horse had which did not result in the grimace, which was the whole point of this. She's very constructional. And the, um, but the main point here is, think of a dog doing it, one of these agility types of things, and, and, they, and, and there's a lot of reinforcement goes on, both social reinforcement from the owner, affection, and food going on. But the animal has somehow hurt its paw a little bit, not enough to make it noticeably limp. But when it had to jump over, let's say, uh, a barrier of some type, you know, it hurts it a little. But the owner is totally unaware. Now, if there were two routines, one with the similar thing, but without the jump, <laughs> and the animal chose to do the one without the jump, you'd investigate why was it about the jump that was aversive. And so by carefully utilizing your critical consequences and giving alternatives, one should be able, and I'm not an animal trainer, so I'm just a speculation on my part, uh, works with people, <laughs> but uh, but one should be able to tease out some of the variables for the hesitancy or uh, are not non-preferential parts of routines by leaving some out and putting some in. Given alternatives, you can do either one. So it would be very interesting to explore that. And so there, an animal who has one degree of freedom then can tell you something based upon the program-specific consequences that are masked if those alternatives are not there. So that's what we mean by degrees of freedom, if that helps clarify. Right, and so that's, uh, and one of our members asked the question that she would love to hear you talk more about how positive reinforcement can potentially be coercive. And my understanding is, from what you've just shared with us, is that if there's one degree of freedom, oh sorry, no degrees of freedom. Zero, yeah. Zero Mm -hmm. degrees of freedom, then there might be... It is coercive. It is so it is by definition degrees. it's coercive. Okay, cool. And but the the question isn't necessarily whether you want to be never want to be coercive, because kids don't have a choice about whether they're gonna to learn to read either, right? <laughs> they're coerced into reading. Yeah, it's damn good for them because it opens up many, many, many more degrees of freedom for them later on. So the question one has is to recognize that you are utilizing a bit of coercion. But what is the outcome of that? And are there other ways of doing it that involve even worse ways of coercion? In other words, you can look at it as degrees of coercion as well. In other words, am I going to use a a compulsion training? Or am I going to use 
an aversive stimulus that they then have to remove, all right, to achieve the same thing. Um, so what you can look at then is what type and levels of coercion am I going to use? Positive reinforcement is the least probably, uh, uh, you know, uh, coercive. aversive form of coercion in that sense. So I'm thinking of an example in my life. Uh, I have, I like to label myself as, uh, and maybe it's a limiting belief on my part, limited resources with my toddler and, and running animal training academy uh, and my animals. And so for my dog Phoebe to get access to chicken pieces, uh, she has to do X behavior, flop on her side and lie still while I trim all her nails. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's zero degrees of freedom there for her to get yeah, those are, right those are yeah but you know she has nice she's probably uh uh probably doesn't hate doing it and so on you know the question is if you did all those things but without that and then and had one with the nails would she choose the one with or without the nails <laughs> yeah and, and then, you know and the uh then you'd say well the nails are still a little aversive so she is being coerced into doing it if she does it equally or prefers the nails you say oh the nails became part of the game and so they're not aversive it's not aversive to you, right? right and and so i could i could put uh some of what you've just suggested into into play to to tease some of these uh, yeah. elements out uh, Re resources would be required to do that so I'll choose yeah. not to yeah. especially over the next six months right. at least um, right. so I just wanted to to uh, hear your thoughts on what the message is for the audience of this podcast who might be now going I've, I've got to offer more degrees of freedom and all of that. you don't have to you don't you don't have to always do it you have to just keep it in mind in other words is it possible to do that's the one question. You know, they, people use start buttons. So why not two start buttons for two different routines that are offered at the same time that have basically the same consequence, right? And the animal comes up and presses one button if it wants to do one routine and have the other button in another. And then the question is, so they can both give the same consequence, what about each routine is governing the choice? They ask, you know, that might be kind of fun. And so there are a variety of things one can do. But on the other hand, you know, um, uh, sometimes it's just good for the dog. Uh, you know better than they do, basically, what's going to be good for their welfare uh, and so on. And so uh, using positive reinforcement to course um, uh, a behavior is not necessarily the worst thing in the world. That makes me feel better about zero degrees of freedom <laughs> for people at the moment right. in the, in right. our dreaming. Um, well, thank you for all of that. Uh, Joe, there's two, there's two more questions that our sure. membership has asked me to put to you today, and I'm grateful for sure. you hanging out with us for this duration of time to, to get through them. Um, so the next question, one of our members said, she would love if Joe could explain extinction in his words at the CAAWT conference, Constructional Approach to Animal Welfare and Training, mm -hmm. Sean Well and uh, Messer. He said, extinction isn't the non-occurrence of a reinforcer. Extinction is the breaking of a contingency. There could Correct. be reinforcement present and still have extinction. So the presence and absence of reinforcements actually is not the defining characteristics of extinction. So this True. member was really keen to hear what breaking the contingency looks like and, and hear how you define extinction. That's actually pretty simple to define. It's when the, uh, uh, when it's no longer a requirement for the consequence to occur for X and Y to occur. In other words, for the occasion of behavior to occur. In other words, the, uh, the consequence will occur if the occasion is there, the consequence will occur if just the behavior is there, or the consequence can occur even if the occasion of behavior is not there. In other words, there's no relation between the consequence, occasion, and behavior. Where there's no relation, there's no contingency. And so, where that had been established and you remove it is uh, how we define extinction. And we've done, we actually ran experiments in our lab where uh, you, if you look at the triplet of occasion behavior consequence, uh, there are eight forms that triplet can take. In other words, uh, you know, no, no, uh, you can have the occasion, the behavior, the consequence, you can have occasion, no behavior, uh, you know, I mean, um, 
yeah, occasion, no behavior, no consequence, no occasion, no behavior, no consequence. You do this down, removing one each time, you'll find there's eight of them. When you remove three of the eight, such that the consequence must, uh, for it to occur, both the occasion and behavior must occur, but the occasion and behavior can occur without the consequence, you'll find that you've reduced your eight triplets to five. So basically, what a contingency is, is reinstating all eight po triplet possibilities. So that there's no relation, it's breaking the relation. Uh, extinction, uh, some people say it's both a procedure and a process, but it is primarily um, done without reference actually to frequency of behavior. It's done as a, as a means of, I've, I've removed the contingency and let's see what happens. Typically behavior will decline. But actually, given different baselines and different uh, uh, contingency baselines, uh, behavior will persist a tremendous length of time in, in extinction at very low consistent rates, given the dip usually the baseline is no reinforcement. And your animal just walks around the chamber pressing the lever, let's say, or there's a light, the lever press, and so forth, but no no consequence, and we get what's called the operant level, then you start the experiment. But you can set it up, and this was done, so that the animals run around and the food hopper operates. The animal runs over and gets the food. And sometimes the light comes on and the food hopper operates. Sometimes the animal hits the lever and the food hopper operates. Sometimes the animal hits the lever and then nothing happens. Sometimes, you know, all the eight elements are present. And you run that for a while. Now you run your experiment, and what we found was we gave two different uh, baselines, one with the historically, one with just uh, the reinforcer continually, uh, the stimulus that acts as a reinforcer, it's not a reinforcer yet, the stimulus that acts as a reinforcer, um, continually absent, and one where it's available on this randomly through these eight elements. We run the experiment, and you'll see no different results and patterns in the animal differ during the experiment, and now we place the animals under different types of extinction uh, so that the animal that, that got one type now gets both types, right? And the other, the other animal got one type now gets both types. And what you see is entirely different behavioral patterns during extinction for those types, for those animals. So there isn't one characteristic response rate during extinction. It depends upon what the baseline contingencies were. And so um, uh, we define extinction then is the removal of the contingency relation, not the removal of a reinforcer. You can remove that relation by removing a reinforcer, <laughs> right? If it never occurs, then that relation is broken. But that's just one way of doing it. There are other ways of doing it. I will be listening back to all of that. But it's changed my understanding of extinction. Uh, and I look forward to the conversations that are going to come out of that uh, part of this podcast episode in our community. One last question. This one's a doozy. And this is the one I read to you before we push record, Joe. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on it. And it says, if Joe were a politician and he was pro-vaccine, how would he go about encouraging people to get vaccinated without making them feel coerced? Seems like there are some people digging in their heels because they don't have any degrees of freedom when it comes to being allowed to resume their usual activities, work, social gatherings, sport, etc. Their only option is to be vaccinated. If it were Joe's job to convince a population to get the vaccination, how would he use his knowledge of coercion and degrees of freedom to get it done? I'm not sure it would play a huge role. Uh, what would play a huge role with my uh, understanding of nonlinear relations and my understanding of, of, and this is a complex topic, in that the reasons people give for doing things and the reason people that, the, and the variables actually governing what they're doing do not necessarily have to correspond. In essence, the question I would have, you would have to develop different strategies for different types of contingencies that are involved. Some of it is um, making it so that um, there's enough uh, reducing the aversiveness of, of, of 
what could happen from getting the vaccine and making the science known and the results known and, and comparing them to other vaccines in the past. You know, smallpox vaccine actually killed people who got the vaccine, um, which and much higher numbers than anything that's ever been reported for this one. Yeah, do you, any, and I'd ask, does anyone know anyone with smallpox? And the answer is no, because we have a vaccine, <laughs> right? So it turned out to be a good thing. So this is one reason. But there are other reasons, and that has to do with belonging. In other words, oftentimes we get to belong in a community where we support what we say to one another and what we say to the outside world. And oftentimes where the outside world or the outside communities uh, don't, we singularly don't have much effect. When we're within another group, we have an effect. And maybe that effect is actually someone sticking a microphone in our face or in the group's face. And so what happens is I will take on certain positions because my critical consequence is belonging to that group and being part of something, even if it means putting me and my family at risk in order to do so. So the broader social question is, that I would step back and ask is, what is society not providing that makes belonging to such a group so potent that one would put their life and the life of loved ones and others at risk in order to maintain it. And so that becomes basically uh, the question that I think would uh, that may need to be addressed for a, a, a percentage of the folks who are anti-vaccine. Now there are individuals who um, uh, have different consequences and different reasons and so on and so forth. And so there's not just one overall strategy, but it's a, a group of strategies involved. Um, I mean, the, uh, the fact is, you know, um, one is required, has zero degrees of freedom of driving uh, out, uh, on the highway without a driver's license, <laughs> without facing a, a punitive. <laughs> and people seem to have no problem with that. So the argument that, oh, that's because they're not giving me a choice. But if you start down all the things you're not given a choice that you do, <laughs> right, you'll find out you, there's a lot of them people do. So that can't be the real reason, right? That can't be the real reason. But it can be the stated reason. And then I'd look at, at why that's important to the people and what contingencies are reflected in that, right? And when people are so angry about doing this, well, what is it they want to drive away, right? And what is it, and what, does that result in driving something away? Or does that result in me uh, going back to my group and getting a lot of hands on my back? <laughs> you know, patted on my back for, well, oh, you really were tough. You really stuck up for it. So you have to look at all those variables uh, uh, when looking at these types of issues. And it's very difficult when you have groups where the leaders of the group gain their control over the group and their influence by making sure the group engages in behavior that those outside the group are likely to condemn. Because when that happens, they are driven further back into the group for their reinforcers. And it makes the within group reinforcement even stronger. So the outside group has a dilemma of if we really condemn this and force it, well, that then increases the power of the leadership within these groups, right? And that is advocating that their power comes from having followers and dedicated people who stick with their program, politicians, other politicians and social act people, and their reinforcers are the old common ones of you know, being adulated um, and having power. So in order to maintain my position in the group, I have to take a position that is condemned by the outside group. And, and by doing that is the way that I actually demonstrate that I have some effect on that outside group. So it becomes a very complex set of interaction contingencies that one has to deal with. The same thing happens, by the way, in any type of cult. This is exactly what goes on. Or any type of... Uh, uh, areas is that you want to isolate from the population. You want to become the main feeder of information to the group. You don't want information too much coming from outside. 
but information that's coming from outside is immediately attacked and rejected. And you want to get the, your members to engage in behaviors that are, that are opposed by the outside. That's how you maintain a cult, whether it's a religious cult, whether it's a monastery where you dress in a brown robe and shave your head and, and uh, sing goofy songs and so on, right? Or chants or whatever, Gregorian chants, if it's a Christian monastery or whatever. Again, this, by the way, you see a little bit of this in military use. The first week, uh, when you want his first draft in the military, what do they do? You're taken off to a location, your head is shaved, you're, you're, you're there, and people start yelling at you. In other words, there's massive stimulus change. So reinforcers that were operating uh, and contingencies operating when you were outside the military are no longer operable. You have stimulus change, your patterns are disrupted, new patterns occur that are then reinforced by the group, which is the military at this time, and they become your primary source of information. And then their, their reinforcers are the relationships among the troops and the camaraderie and, and, and following orders and how that affects one another. And so they can shape behavior effectively. So these processes aren't unique, but they're not well understood in terms of their social implications. And that's really what's going on, I believe, in the, in the anti-vaccine movements and so forth. Well, I think if anyone listening is like me, and I, I will make an assumption that there are some similarities in thought process, processes, we appreciate that this applies to so much more than just vaccines. Uh, in our current global situation, but, but I <laughs> scared to bring up anything else on this animal training podcast. Um, but, but, I, but I think it applies to animal trainers as well. We talk about on this show uh, the us versus them mentality, uh, mm -hmm. and some of the things you've talked about today, I think, have a lot of relevance to on the spot. I'm thinking things I see in some social media groups um, about how people with different training philosophies mm -hmm. um, are potentially, I'm going to use the word attacked, um, that's going to push from, from what you've just shared with us, those individuals back into their groups to get their reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes a, within group reinforcement more potent. It's kind of and terrifying. The, uh, yeah, and, and, the way, and the way, of course, is to develop relationships yeah. and show how they can get more benefit at less cost by changing their behavior over a period of time is a way to uh, uh, bring, bring a group along. Um, and this has been done successfully in people who've gotten people out of the Ku Klux Klan and other types of neo-Nazi organizations. They actually go in and befriend them and, uh, and bring them into a larger community with a larger reinforcement base and they'll switch. And actually Saudi Arabia has a program for rehabbing uh, certain uh, uh, terrorist groups that are come from uh, Islamic traditions. Uh, they have a program which does some of that similarly to that. They reintegrate them, basically, slowly uh, by providing these uh, types of relations. So it's, it does. It has to do with, by the way, it has to do with uh, kids at school feeling left out. So if I um, am a good, I use this example all the time, if I'm a good debater and there's a debate club and I can win and, and get social praise for that, right? That's great. But can I go to the local the school dance and dance with someone? Well, can I sit at the table at the cafeteria and talk with someone, right? So in other words, let's just take those three, for example. If I only can do the debate, I have zero degrees of freedom. I'm coursed into debating for my social reinforcers. If I can do, if I can dance and do all that, well, then I've got one de degree of freedom. If I can do the other, I have three degrees of freedom. So I see a kid at school who's saying, you know, Joe is very successful. He's such a good debater. He's won all these prizes. I don't see why he would be unhappy. Well, because vis-a-vis -vis the other kids, I, only, I have zero degrees of freedom where they have two. So when I walk down the hallway and someone says something to me like, hey, jerk, oh, that threatens even the last remaining degree of that one reinforcer I have. And so a mild kind of uh, uh, comment can be taken as a major attack. Whereas if I have multiple degrees of freedom and someone says jerk, I go, yeah, so what? If he doesn't want to talk to me, that's all right. Or his group doesn't, I've got all these others who will, right? So 
what we fail to understand is that these are very potent in understanding the ecology of what the kids live under. And so a kid can feel very left out in school while still very successful at something. And teachers' jobs and principals' jobs and so on should be ascertaining the degrees of freedom available for each of their learners vis-a-vis -vis the other learners. And where they see differences, intervene to correct that. That will stop a lot of the kids from feeling left out and so on. And this is what makes the cyberbullying so potent. They say, well, why does something over the internet does this? You do look at the degrees of freedom the kids who are bullied have vis-a-vis -vis the others. And what the damage that bullying is a signal for versus the others who have larger degrees of freedom. And so this is why these things tend to occur and why uh, uh, we can use these analyses to actually intervene, to prevent isolation, uh, to be more inclusive, and so forth. We can understand things such as prejudice, bigotry, and racism. So uh, uh, fear is distancing, uh, distancing as a reinforcer from a harmful stimulus uh, with me removing myself. The object stays, I run. Anger is I stay, I drive the object away, right? So prejudice is defined basically, you'll talk about white fear, white flight. Well, prejudice typically is I try to get away from it. I don't want to sit near that person. I don't want to do this. So I'm, I'm away from this, right? So prejudice is defined by the distancing of a group, right, from another. And it applies to the whole group rather than an individual. And it's the characteristics of the group. That's what we call a prejudice. Where bigotry occurs is where I'm trying to distance the group who has a particular characteristic. I'm attacking, I'm angry, I'm screaming at them. That's the bigotry. Racism is where I use the levers of the society I'm in. And that's including political, social, economic, any of the levers that has the effect of removing either the means, the occasion, I mean, the opportunity, the occasion, the means, the behavior, or the benefit, the consequence, that affects another group. In other words, the isms, whether it's racism, sexism, hom uh, uh, homophobia, uh, uh, type of isms that are, are, are there. In other words, what I'm saying is, am I, any of the isms basically, am I utilizing any of these to reduce someone else's degrees of freedom vis-a-vis -vis any of these. So, and it's fascinating is that I can then have racism without being a racist. Except my patterns have historically resulted in removing an opportunity or a means from another piece from another group. Even though that's not my co that's not my reinforcer. In other words, my reinforcer isn't the removal of that. My reinforcer is something else, but the behavior has the program's specific reinforcer of removing an occasion, a behavior, or a consequence. Therefore, I can be, a, I can get, and there's an example in San Francisco, um, there's an article in a journal called The Black Scholar. And they went and found that a whole range of teachers within the school system uh, would try to mentor and support minority students, and particularly African-American students. And what they would do is they would lower the requirements for grades for those students in their classes so that they'd feel more successful and, and be able to uh, make the grade in terms of grades and so on and promotions within the school. And the kids love these teachers and the teachers love the kids. But what the article pointed out was by having that different criteria, the kids didn't have to meet the same required criteria of the whites, so they were less prepared for more advanced classes later on. So in other words, it used one of the levers of, of, the, of society to remove the means so they couldn't respond to the opportunity. So that was, that was an example of racist behavior. Even though that was not what was maintaining the behavior of the, of the teachers. And their students love them. Their minority students love them. So that isn't even the defining characteristic. So that's why 
these types of analyses can be so powerful and important in understanding how we can make uh, societal changes as well as changes in our animal trade. Lots of thoughts, lots of questions. Uh, but we're going to head towards the end, I think. And I really appreciated all sure. of that. And I'm going to go re-listen to all of um, it as well. And I, I don't think, you know, I'm, I d that wasn't the answer I expected from the question that I asked, or the one of our members <laughs> asked, but I'm glad that I asked it. And I think it's, uh, I, I, I say, changed my life. And like that sounds like really profound, but really if, if that information can help me see things differently moving forward from now until my final days then that has changed my life so I don't think I'm going to look at an isolated child again ever the same after just listening right. to you share with us just then so that was a gift uh, and thank you for, well, thank for you. sharing with it sharing it with us uh, like I said though sadly we're going to head towards the end and Joe we do have one last question for you yeah. um, we want to hear after uh, your, everything you've done over your career thinking forward now uh, over the next five to ten years, where do you really want us as an industry, as a uh, animal training industry, using applied behaviour analysis uh, in, information, and, and working with human learners? Where do you want to see us going? Well, I I think um, I attend animal conferences, even though I'm not an animal trainer, and I like the trends I see and where you're going. I see more attention to detail. Uh, uh, exploring new issues, uh, looking at new procedures, uh, asking new questions. And I think, you know, how we started out the conversation was, you know, do something that you don't feel quite equipped to do and teach yourself how to do it. And I think that's what I'd like to see, you know, continually doing. And I think I see quite a bit of that. And also uh, learn more about the basic science uh, and some of these nonlinear relations and so forth and take them in creative ways that I can't even think of uh, that you could take them. I think there's a variety of things that can be done. Um, there's a variety of new uh, procedures. I think the one thing that I would like to see the animal community do a little bit more than what I typically see is some, do some creative ways of taking data on what they do with their animals. Uh, there's some interesting new uh, technologies that allow one to uh, monitor the behavior of animals in free ranging environments to get a view of all the alternatives and everything they do. That gives you a picture of what they do in the context of, of uh, their environments that heretofore have been, not been possible because of the machine learning algorithms and the technologies and the miniaturizations that are now available. And so I'd like to see, you know, uh, maybe a little bit more use, utilization of that just forward to see where uh, the really creative trainers that I've seen, I've been extraordinarily impressed with what I've seen. Uh, the work by folks out there, uh, uh, particularly, uh, uh, you know, I like listening to what Susan Friedman has to say, and I like listening to uh, Ken Ramirez and Steve White, and, you know, these are folks I see uh, quite a bit, Alex Curlin. Uh, uh, Barbara Heinrich is fabulous. She just does tremendous work. Uh, and so all of these folks and many, many more that I'm not mentioning, uh, Hannah and, and all, many, many more, uh, uh, Eva, uh, I mean, you can just go down the line of people that just do creative, uh, uh, tremendous work uh, from all over the world. And I'm just excited to see what they're all doing. And, and, uh, uh, and, I, and I know I shouldn't have started mentioning people because <laughs> there's people I don't mention that I know are going to be mad at me, <laughs> Shrek probably, but, uh, and others. But uh, uh, just suffice to say that I, I love what you're doing. Uh, I love what Sean Pogson does with, both, with his daughter and with his animal and how, he, and how public he is about it and so forth um, and the work he's doing. And Vidya and her work in concept teaching with her animals and so forth are just phenomenal. So, um, you know, just keep doing, pushing the limits is what I'd like to see people do and understand it's the contingencies operating and understand that when they're looking at emotions in their dog, uh, we don't know whether the dogs have emotions or not, but we do know that dogs have similar contingencies to humans and human emotions describe those contingencies. And if one were to uh, posit an evolutionary continuum, it is likely that there are physiological changes that occur with the changing contingencies that humans will 
engage in and describe in certain emotional, using emotional terms. So there is an overlap there. So the issue is to understand the contingencies, though, uh, that give rise to that um, in both animals and humans, uh, rather than, you know, there's a, a book out uh, uh, by uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett, and um, I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Um, it's on, on emotions. How emotions are made, I think, is the name of the book. And the research data are pretty clear. There are no brain imprints for emotions. There's no anger area in your brain. There's no uh, happiness area in your brain. <laughs> There's no uh, fear area in the brain and so on. What they found is that under a variety of situations, you'll get exactly the same physiological change. But you describe it as fear or excitement based upon the contingency under which you're operating. So you are not trying to describe an internal event. What you use in your emotion words are trying to describe the contingencies under which you're behaving, of which you do not have the words for either. So in essence, when we use emotions, it, the, it, the paradox is we're actually trying to convey our outers rather than our inners. <laughs> in essence, I'm angry, which means there's something I want to get away. I want something to stop, right? <laughs> and so the, uh, um, so, you know, that's where I think in the next five years, I, I think, you know, uh, to look at uh, the science and, this, and the neuroscience and the behavioral science and the nonlinear contingency analysis, and but keep up the fun. Because the one motto I've always had in my life was nothing beats fun. And so what governed all my choices was, is this going to be fun? If the answer was no, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> so that's the one advice I give. Do what's fun. As Joe Lang on The Secrets of Happiness, <laughs> everyone. That's right. Um, and a great place, you said one thing you hope that people keep doing is learning more about the basics of science. One place that we can do that very shortly is with your new book. Can you remind everyone listening yes. uh, about when your book's coming out and, we, and how they can find it? it should, well, they say it's coming out October 27th. And again, it's called Nonlinear Contingency Analysis, Going Beyond Cognition and Behavior in Clinical Practice. It's published by Rutledge. It's an international publisher, so it'll be available worldwide. Um, and I hope everyone uh, uh, runs out, buys a copy, <laughs> and, and then uh, looks at the impact it can have. And I would love to hear people's feedback on the book after they read it. Um, uh, the reviews so far have been very good, so I'm pleased with that. But uh, it's something that uh, I think is very important. Uh, we're looking at, uh, I'm trying to encourage a group to write a book on emotions, uh, nonlinear contingency analysis and emotions. And then uh, we're doing another one, I'm doing another book on a very esoteric topic that will appeal to at least 25 people in the world <laughs> on verbal behavior. But, uh, but that is a highly technical book written for a, 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 a much more limited audience. But uh, that's what's coming in my future. Well, exciting. And you listen to this podcast, if you're listening when it just came out, today is the 12th of October in New Zealand. It's the 11th. Uh, we're in the future, Joe. Uh, yep. So, But by the time this episode's out, the book, if it has been released as planned, uh, will already be out. So we will link to that book in the show notes for this episode as well as another alternative to, to increase you. your degrees of freedom with regards to where you can go to find it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Hey, Joe, this has been so much fun. So from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, we really appreciate you taking the time to come and hang out with us at Animal Training Academy. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Well, it was a great deal of fun, and I enjoyed the questions, and you obviously have a great audience. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com 
and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behaviour geeks. That's it for this episode though, we're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening, you'll hear from us again soon.